terror. <coughs> Biting, clawing, gnawing its way into your brain. Hello, Counter Crew. I have a very unusual New Year's tradition to share with you. And yes, I get it. It's not New Year's, and it is definitely March. But, uh, forgive me, audience, for I have sinned. Uh, the great sin of tardiness. I'm not great at making a schedule. Um, so we're gonna pretend it's New Year's. Let's put on our imagination glasses. Um, so I start the new year by watching something old. Uh, specifically giallos, which are these retro sleazy, like, Italian murder mysteries. And this episode is a roundup of some of the best giallos I've seen this month, or at least some of the most interesting. Um, so first off, for some of you guys, you know what a giallo is, but for some of you guys, you don't know what a giallo is. So let's, uh, let's do a quick and dirty explanation. So giallos had their height their heyday in the 60s through I'd say early 90s. Uh, they are named giallo, which is Italian for yellow. And why are they named yellow? So initially when they got started, uh, some of the novels that they were based off of were these pulpy Italian murder mysteries and they had these bright yellow covers so that you would reach and get them because who could resist something with a yellow cover? Um, now, they're typically Italian. They're not exclusively Italian. Um, we'll, we'll talk about one that's not Italian a little bit later in the episode. And usually they're kind of psychosexual. They're a little, they're a little not safe to watch with your parents. So don't watch these with your parents uh, if you have parents that you live with. <laughs> and uh, they have their own tropes that are very exclusive to the genre. Like a great example is black leather gloves. These are not black and leather, they're opera gloves. Uh, but black leather gloves are usually on the killer. Uh, I personally just want to show off these. Now, these are not entirely, like, gonna show up in every single, like, giallo ever. There are plenty of jolly that do not have black leather gloves in them, but they're tropes that are typical of the genre. So without further ado, let's get this show on the road. We're doing Dario Argento does Phantom of the Opera, but not that version of Dario Argento doing Phantom of the Opera. Th this version of Dario Argento doing Phantom of the Opera. So what is this about? Prima donna soprano Maria Chakova has come down with a terrible case of getting hit by a car. And her understudy, Betty, our young ingenue, is now Lady Macbeth in the opera Macbeth. After Betty's finished with her first performance, it is a triumph, but her success is marred with murder as a black club killer is stalking the ingenue and taking cues from the Scottish play as bodies start piling up. Now, I know that these are slightly different from each other, the Phantom of the Opera, the one with Eric in it, and Opera, but you know, this has less romance and far more crows in it. And uh, I think both are valid. Um, but really, I love this one in a, in a, for a serious reason, which is visually, this is very similar to Suspiria, like vastly different subject matters, but like it's something in the color palette that just really reminds me of that movie. Maybe it's because both of them have to do with classical art forms. Suspiria has to do with ballet. This one has to do with tap dancing, just kidding, opera. But it's also in how kind of cruelly and coolly brutal this is. Like the kills are rad. It's not as visually gorgeous as Suspiria, but like, it's pretty neat. Um, eyeball nails, brilliant. Uh, peephole shootout, uh, iconic, great. And this is all, by the way, accentuated by heavy metal music because Dario Argento went through a weird phase in like the late 80s where he was really into heavy metal music. Just another little sprinkling of his idiosyncrasies in his films. Um, and in terms of a mystery as a giallo, this is, this is kind of bullshit. I'm, I'm just here to say it's kind of bullshit. 
But you know what? Controversial statement. You did not come to any Jalo for the mystery. That is secondary to it. It's primarily there for kind of shock value and for entertainment reasons. And it is entertaining. Like, this follows the rule of cool and has fun performances where, like, people know what movie they're in. They're in a movie where crows attack the audience at an opera. And really, it just sells this movie, like, and it sells the ridiculousness of it all. But speaking of ridiculousness, our next one takes the cake. Or I should say the orgy. So let's talk about Arabella, the Black Angel. I feel like I give you guys one terrible giallo a year. Last year it was Policemen Are Blundering in the Dark. This year it's Arabella, Black Angel by Stelvio Massi, or as I'm sure he likes to be called via his IMDb page, Max Steele. Uh, he's really come up with a cinematic gem. It's like him and the Lumiere brothers <laughs> for cinematic greatness. Arabella is a nymphomaniac with a heart of gold, and she's just devastated and going through a hard time after her writer husband went through a terrible accident, and their marriage is on the rocks. He has the worst temper. He has no inspiration, which is really bad because they're going to be out of their house soon. And she relaxes via going to orgies. Now, um, unfortunately, this orgy goes horrendously wrong as a cop shuts him down and then corners Arabella and then, like, eventually shows up at her house and then blackmails her into sex. And she, what does she do to make matters worse? Her husband catches her in the act. And then her response is to, uh, murder the policeman via bonking him on the head like a Looney Tunes character. Yes, that truly does happen. Um, and then inspiration strikes her husband and he's like, I, I know what I'm gonna write about. She's like, is it about corrupt policemen? And he's like, no, it's about your sex life, Arabella, my God. <laughs> um, and a black glove killer starts stalking her to just make stuff even worse for her. This movie has everything you want in a so bad it's good movie. The plot is easy to follow, follow. the pacing is quick. It is an hour and 30 minutes, so you're not gonna be there for a long time, and it's not technically incompetent. Some people love a so bad it's good movie that it's just technically incompetent. I think that you need to give a shit a little bit to make something that's just so bad it's good. So this one at least tried a little. But um, what it lacks in, I will say, like a cinematic experience and visual, like, impressiveness is the fact that this movie is simply bonkers. What you see on the screen is gonna be insane. Uh, the plot, you'll never see it coming. Guaranteed, I watch a lot of movies. I did not see one minute of this coming, yet it also somehow makes sense. So I will end by saying Arabella's slutty suit that she wears for a lot of this movie is iconic and I want it and Again, I say slutty suit, but I mean that in the best way humanly possible. High quality movies. This one isn't it, but the next one is. So this one's hard to find and I rarely see it screen. So if you find it, see it. This is my Lucio Fulci pick, a uh, lizard in a woman's skin. So what is this about? Carol Hammond is the wife of a successful London lawyer who's been having erotic nightmares. And awkwardly enough, they're of a really sexy neighbor. And sometimes that neighbor gets murdered in them in a sexy way. And now her neighbor is dead for real, like in her sexy, sexy dreams. Now, why do I like this? This is a visually stunning, surrealist nightmare. And I think that this is one of the pretty shallows. Um, I also want a re-release of this that is not washed out. By the way, just a heads up, I saw the R-rated version. I did not see the X-rated version. I did not see the one with all the sex scenes added in there. So why also watch this movie? Florinda Bulkin is one of these like, I'm gonna call them giallo countesses. I can't think of a royal title that starts with a G. Um, so I'm gonna call them giallo countesses. Uh, people like, um, Let's see, Susie Kendall, uh, Edwidge Frenich, 
if you want a real cult one, Yevis Navarro, who I quite like. Florinda Bolkin really adds something to it. She brings a gravitas to the genre. And I think it takes a certain sort to really get these things right. Giallo plots are really weird. It's Agatha Christie meets Sigmund Freud. And some of them have these pseudo supernatural elements. And to Florinda, she makes this feel very normal. And it takes a certain type to do that. Like, she doesn't take the material so seriously, but she also does, you know, believe and buy into it. This also features uh, dummy falls, which are my favorite little giallo trope. Uh, obviously, this is a subgenre that was very much inseminated from the 60s to the 80s, and special effects led quite a bit to be desired. Uh, so we got very liberal use out of red paint and throwing mannequins off of buildings. And I love the mannequins that get thrown off of the buildings over here. They're great. <laughs> and this one also plays, takes place in the United Kingdom. And you get to see Italians take on British culture and also the Irish because the Irish are in Britain in this one. Let me, let me clarify because my partially Irish producer is like, but you make it seem like it takes place in Ireland. It doesn't. It takes place in England, in London, but it does involve the IRA and you have Italian people doing Irish face. I will let you decide whether or not that's problematic. I think it's neat that it takes place in the UK. I don't know how you're going to feel about Italians dressing up as Irish people. Your mileage may vary. Let me know in the comments section if it's problematic for Italian people to dress up as Irish people. Anyways, this time we're actually moving out of like the entirety of the European continent for the next one. And we're moving to Asia. So I did mention that Jalos are not exclusively Italian. This one's from Hong Kong. We're moving continents, baby. Uh, we're gonna be talking about Red Knights of the Jade Executioner, also known as Red Knights. Um, so just a heads up before we get into this one, it's not a straight giallo. It is an, what I'm gonna call an action giallo. So I got this information from the Unifrance press kit for Red Knights of the Jade Executioner. How can you find this information? Google it or go to the Unifans website and just put it in the search bar. It's that easy to get this information. So, uh, directors Julian Carbone and uh, Laurent Cotillard were not trying to copy a giallo. They were trying to get in the headspace of that sort of directors to come up with a style and tone that managed to meld giallo staples and Hong Kong action elements, creating a Frankenstein monster of sorts with uh, erotic undertones and black gloves and also women kicking each other in the face. Um, it's less of a mystery film and it's more of an action film. So if you're going into it with those expectations, I think you'll be happy. That being said, what is this about? In ancient times, the Chinese emperor commissioned the world famous Jade Executioner to create a poison like no other, and he succeeded. The Jade Executioner created a poison that killed through what he called pleasure, making the body extremely sensitive. So sensitive, in fact, that the slightest feathery touch could make someone... I didn't want to say come, but a week into going and making this script, this is the only thing I can come up with, so uh, come. And the slightest prick of your skin could make it feel like fiery agony. So we're now in modern times and there are three women who are racing to find the poison of the Jade Executioner. And the three women battle it out, trying not to succumb to the poison or each other. So first things first, the name is fantastic. I could go on a whole tangent about how much I like Jalo naming conventions. Uh, some of them are just very long and intricate. Um, let me give you some examples. Uh, from last Jalo, you are a forbidden photos of a woman above suspicion. Or everyone's other favorite death on a four poster, 
bet if you didn't get their drift. Um, and everyone's favorite, a classic for the whole family, Naked Girl Murdered in the Park. So this name is just right at home with this. And also I love the little like red knights because sometimes the Jallo names get shortened because we can't all be subjected to forbidden woman, forbidden photos of a woman above suspicion. You see, it's a name so long, I can't even get it right for the third take. If it doesn't shock you, I want to show you something even more interesting. Want to see? <laughs> but that being said, uh, the mix of an action and a giallo should not necessarily work. And according to some critics, it doesn't really work. But to those critics, I say, this is my channel, so it's my rules. I would also say, like, you have to take this film on its own terms. And that's how you're gonna get the best experience out of it. Like, the Hong Kong action is very much up at front with the giallo elements kind of being put more to the back. Uh, it very much shows in the set design and obviously the use of latex, which is seriously in this movie. Um, but also the sensual nature of the film. Like there's quite a bit of BDSM elements in here and it feels at home in the subgenre. This is an expansion of the giallo as a whole by not only combining these completely disparate genres with each other, but also many giallos for their time were considered quite gory and quite bloody. Um, but this is a whole nother level because we were shooting this and releasing this in the 2010s. So red paint, this ain't. Uh, just a heads up. Anyways, we're gonna conclude on a straight giallo, but it's a ton of fun. All right, so we're gonna conclude with director Luciano Ercoli, who's proving to all of us that you don't need black gloves to make a giallo. Sometimes they can be metal as we're gonna talk about Death Walks at Midnight. So what is this about? Our protagonist, Valentina, is dropping acid for the very first time with her terrible boyfriend. I mean, she's not dropping acid. I would never talk about drugs on this channel. She, it, it's HDS, definitely not acid. Who are you, who are you talking about? Implicating me in your drug nonsense. Anyways, her first trip is a doozy. Uh, as she is High as a kite, she sees some gory sights as a metal glove hand repeatedly punches a woman in the face. And when she sobers up, she tells her terrible, terrible boyfriend, who I would also argue is probably the worst boyfriend in all of Italian history. Really, this man's a piece of shit. Um, and he gaslights her and he's like, suck it up, girl. It's just a dream, but it's not just a dream. It's very real as uh, her boyfriend, who is now published without her permission, her drug-fueled mania um, has destroyed her reputation and the metal-gloved killer is now going after her in her personal life. Wow, Valentina, girl, you're in danger. Death Walks at Midnight is the very definition of like, silly fun. Like it's the funnest like Saturday night slasher, except it takes place in the daytime. Uh, also features the best killer ever. I just happen to like this guy's face. Um, but also I love the glove variation. Like the black gloves are a serious trope for the genre and this is a great variation on it. It also makes for a very unique murder weapon. Additionally, the cinematography is great. It's very late 60s like dynamic cinematography. Additionally, like, the edit is also very late 60s. Um, but I mostly recommend this one because of Valentina. A lot of giallo protagonists can sometimes be, like, very passive in their own narrative, but not Valentina. Uh, Valentina is an absolute, like, action girl firecracker. Love her. Um, Valentina spends most of this movie uh, having a lot of gumption, punching people in the face and yelling at them and running, lots and lots of running. I swear 90% of this movie is just Valentina running in those heels. But also the mystery is very calm. It's very chill. It feels like a Sunday morning mystery with a lot more gore in it. Uh, and the danger is just not very urgent, but it's still present. Also, if there's one more thing I can use to sell this movie, uh, it has a great parkour fight. <laughs> and I love this guy's like running kick. Uh, it's great. 
Um, so in conclusion, I really hope you at least give one of these movies a chance. I hope you give the subgenre a chance and you have no excuses because most of these are available on Tubi with the exclusion of Lizard in a Woman's Skin, which is available in other places. You just have to look for it. Anyways, I am Bridget Bardo. For all you know, your girl behind the counter. And I talk about movies you don't give a shit about while my eyelash is completely falling off my eye. So know that I have a lot of dedication. Anyways, uh, if you want to find me on Instagram, I am at official girl behind the counter. If you want to find me on Letterboxd, where I talk about movies I love and hate, uh, that's Bardo for all you know. And I'll see you in the next one, Counter Crew, where hopefully my fake eyelash that I did specifically because Jallos use a lot of fake eyelashes does not fall off of me in the next one. Anyways, see ya!